My name is Richard Bland. I guess the main thing is that being brought up in a Christian home, and I've always been told that we can always go by the Bible, the book. And the Bible says in Matthew 7, 12, Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. The first time that I recognized that discrimination was, I was born in Chicago in a neighborhood. In fact, it was a very mixed neighborhood, a Jewish and Italian neighborhood, to be honest with you. And uh, when I went south to remember the first time that I remember, I was seven years old in Coffeyville, Mississippi. And my grandfather and I, and my grandmother, I think, was in town. And uh, a little white boy about my same age, my same size, I don't know the age, told us to get off the sidewalk. And I said, what? No way. And so I said, no. And so my grandfather said, no, you got to get off the sidewalk. I said, what's that? He said, well, the white people have a right to the sidewalk, and black people can walk on it when they're walking on there. So I was so infuriated there. The next day, my grandmother took the train back to Chicago with me and took me back to Chicago. That was probably the first thing that stuck in my mind. And then after then, as I grew up, uh, like I said, I, uh, the, the community that I grew up in, my father was in business. He was in the moving business, cold and ice business. And uh, our customers were all races, you know, in Chicago right there. Uh, born right down the street from Chicago, White Sox. But then as I skip a little along here, as I go a further, I came down south in, uh, in 1949 to visit Oakwood College. I was going to Manny Missionary College at the time. And when we got down here, they were told about how that, you know, they couldn't go to town the same day, the girl, the boy, because of the prejudice and so forth that was going on. And I just couldn't understand, except that I should say I understood it, but I didn't accept that. As I fast forward here and I'm thinking about in 1963, uh, Mega Evers got killed in Mississippi. He was the head of the NAACP for Mississippi. And I came down to his funeral, drove down here to the funeral. And being at the funeral, that's when they put the dogs on us that time. And they, just for no reason whatsoever, the funeral was going down the street there. And that's when I'd like to have been attacked. Actually, I'm skipping there because in 1956, uh, prior to then, because I was living in San Diego in 1963, I came down here after Rosa Parks. Uh, with the bus ride, and to ride on the buses. And discrimination has been something that I felt that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think Jesus came here to this earth to make things fair and honest with people. He came to save those who were misused and abused. So anytime I saw someone misused and abused, okay, where they were, I was totally against that, you see. After we even got to Montgomery, we met people like Roy Wilkins, who was the head of the NAACP, and also uh, Whitney Young, head of the Urban League. At that time, they were the most powerful people. A. a. Philip Randolph, who was the head of the uh, Pullman, I mean, Pullman Train, which was the only union that I think that was the most powerful in America at the time because that's where black people was porters on the trains, you know, and that was a powerful position. In fact, I think he had probably the most influential thing for the this the bars to be the anybody because of his uh, pull that he had there. Then we had uh, Ralph Bunch, who was the Assistant Secretary of the United States government, who said, "I never forget standing beside me." He said, "He said, Glenn, you know this is a shame." He said, "Here I represent America all over the world, and now I'm in the state of Alabama, and they." Can will not fly an American flag on the Capitol. He said, isn't this a shame? These are the type of people, they were all concerned with what was right and what was wrong. And as I look back at it, I just thank the Lord for the people then. Everybody was had a common goal, and that was, let us love. Let us give the love. And that's what Martin Luther King really preached. He said, look, there's a way to win, but the way to win is through Christ. And Christ says, show them love. And then that'll make your enemies your footstool, you know, by doing the right thing. And that's what I was so blessed at that time. And above all things there, I want to make sure that everyone get involved so they can have a blessing. 
And that's why we have made it possible again to sign up for what we call a one day club, dollar club for Jesus. Because I've talked to many prison officials and they told me this. They said, Blaine, I'm going to tell you the truth. We don't care how many trades you give a man. We don't care how much education we give him. But when he leaves without Christ, he's going to do one or two things when he get out of prison. I said, what's that? He said, they're either going to look you up or stick you up. Without Christ, they're going to stick you up. With Christ, they will look you up. And I found that to be true. And I talked to prison. I said, is that true? They said, yes, it's true. Without Christ, don't care how much education we get, because Christ make you a, a giver instead of a taker. That's the difference. So somebody who wants to give, then you know they're Christian. Somebody who wants to take, you know the devil. The devil said, let me take it from you. Let me take eternal life away from you. Let me take the love that you can have for your husband and wife and your children away from you. That's what the devil does. And that's why I said the devil's in control now in this country as I see it, except those who are studying the Word of God in prison. So let's invest in God's Word. The $1 a day club for Jesus. Bloody Sunday, I was looking at the television and I saw, which I didn't want to believe, where the people were walking to a bridge to pray and they were bound down. And all of a sudden, dogs and, I mean, police were just beating on people, it looked like they are jumping in the river, all kinds of chaos was going on. I just couldn't believe it on that Bloody Sunday. And then uh, even the night before, I saw in the news where uh, Pastor Reeve was walking out of a restaurant being white down there helping with the civil rights movement. They killed him. And it was just a horrible thing. And I said, wow, we got to do something down there. I had been in the South once before uh, down there, so I was familiar with what I've seen and heard. So that was what really got me for Bloody Sunday. Well, the march had started. Uh, they only allowed 300 people, understand, to march all the way from Selma to Montgomery because of the highway and so forth. So arrangement had been made that only 300 could do that. And then in that march, I saw a blind man in the march, a white blind man. Then I saw a one-legged man. Then I saw uh, people coming out of Mississippi, ragged, you know, with hardly no shoes on. They were walking. The reason why I said Mississippi because I understand the people in Alabama were not allowed to participate because they had cameras along the highway there. You can see state troopers with cameras in there. I was told if anybody local that was caught in the camera, they would you know, lose their job or lose the electricity or anything, they would cut off. So uh, that's when it was there. And I, like I said previously, I don't know if I mentioned that, I already met Dr. Martin Luther King, and so far we were familiar with it. That's what really inspired me. If they can go, what would Jesus do? That's always sticks in my mind. What would Jesus do? Uh, I saw coming on the trip from Los Angeles was people that I was familiar with, you know. Uh, Archie Moore, who's a friend of mine in San Diego there. His, uh, his sister-in-law, but his brother-in-law was Sidney Portier. So we had a chance to meet a lot of the celebrities over the years. I'm coming down to visit him in there. So I remember on the plane there, I saw this lady, and I uh, I knew she was a movie actress, and I called her Jackie Wilson. She said, Jackie Wilson's a boy. She said, my name is Nancy Wilson. <laughs> so, uh, And then other people there was on the plane there, you know. Uh, we just talked all night long, and we got into Montgomery early the next morning there. So it was different celebrities uh, from uh, that area at that time. Everybody felt like one big family. We had one thing in mind. What would, needs to be done to stop this brutality that's going on in, in our country, because they call it America. It was a, a family affair. You didn't see no big eyes or little U's. Everybody was the same. I mean, people that was dressed raggedy, people that was dressed good, you know. It was all the same. Love. In fact, I even got a picture where I can see this young white girl right now holding a black baby that she picked up that was in the street there because the mother just broke down crying. It was quite a day. I would say to the kids today that I'm saying to the kids now that I see in prison, 16, 17, 18 years old, 
You have to go by what the Bible is saying. The Bible is the only thing to give you stability and give you peace of mind and joy. They're looking for something. In 1962, the Supreme Court voted to take the, the Bible out of the schools. In 1963, they started. So as I look back now, that's the problem. Just the other night in prison, I had a white man that's 47 years old that graduated from one of my Bible classes. Of course, that we have 20 questions there. And he said he had never touched the Bible until just about two weeks ago. So that's the generation that's growing up now. They know nothing about stability. And without Christ, everything is going well. And I said, the devil has just taken over everybody. They don't know why they're fighting. They don't know whether they want police or not. They don't know what's going on. Everybody's mad at everybody. And that's the trick of the devil because if we don't have God in our life, that's the only thing that causes us to have some stability. Is the word of God. And I tell them all, without Christ, you got a bad life. With Christ, you got a happy life. So to get the peace of mind that everybody's looking for, Christ is the answer. No doubt about it. Christ is the answer. It's either going to be crime or Christ. Because as I mentioned before, without a foundation, the foundation is the word of God. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And if people don't realize that God created them, they don't realize that they're somebody. God made somebody. The first two chapters of the Bible, I tell people, if you follow that, I'll see you in the kingdom. What is the first two chapters? It tell you where you come from. It tell you what to eat. It tell you who to marry. It tell you when to worship. Everything's in the first two chapters. And if you find a person that keeps the first two chapters, they'd be on the same plane that I'm on. And they'll meet me in the kingdom. The answer is very simple. Is Christ. Christ is the answer. That's the reason why in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, Christ told the Father, I got the answer. Let me go there and show them the love that you have for me. And that's Christ is the answer. So in the way he's pointed out to us, he made it very simple. He gave us a mirror to look at, which is the Ten Commandments. He gave us somebody that we could follow and that was his son Jesus who lived. How can he do that? Is by spending time with the Word of God. And I tell everyone that if you want to have peace and joy, Christ is the only answer. The devil can give you everything but a peace of mind. Christ is the answer.